welcome everybody to dry dock episode 128 the first standard dry dock of 2021 this week the questions are taken from guide 191 on uss indianapolis and the battle of jutland part 2 sad wings raging asks what ship had the most sails and what ship had the most square footage of sail now as far as i can see no one's actually quantified this there, there may be some references in books that i don't have access to so if anyone has any better candidates please sound off in the comments but the ship with the largest verifiable sail area that i could find was this one the prussian i think that's how it's pronounced um and that has a sail area of just over 6,800 square metres or just over 73,000 square feet on five fully rigged masts. Now you might think looking at that that it's also got a good shot at having the largest number of sails and it has a total of 47, <laughs> believe it or not. But I have a distinct feeling based on some things that I read quite a while ago that it it may well not be and i i have a feeling that the largest number of sails probably belongs to some fancy ship from the early age of sail and i say that because if you look at some of the sail plans for some of the big prestige age of sail ships especially the ones that had four masts not only do they have a whole series of sails on the main mast itself uh, sort of the traditional square ones but they also tend to fly a whole load of very small sails uh, either on the extreme port and starboard of the yards as well as things like royals and, and top gallants at the top so lots of very very much smaller individual sails now i could be wrong on that but again it's not something i've been able to get as much information as i'd like so if anyone has a bit more expertise and can beat 47 sails or almost 7,000 square meters of sail area then please again sound off in the comments so we can all learn something view beyond asks i really enjoy your work but it's hard to understand the movement of the battles would you consider possibly some animation in the future so I think this came up in one of the live streams I did recently and what it basically comes down to is that when it comes to my video content I am if you like judge jury and executioner I am researcher script writer record sound recorder edit sound editor video editor uploader etc there is no one else directly involved in the production of these videos end to end apart from i suppose technically mrs track who has to put up with me wandering around with books and weird naval artifacts at all hours of the day um and has to type relatively softly when i'm doing these recordings but um as a result what you get is what my skills allow me to do and my skills unfortunately don't extend to any kind of significant video animation at the moment now at some point in the future i might be able to learn some of that although it will probably take some time um, and from what i understand there's also a, it, it it will add an awful lot of pr processing time and production time to the video so that's a potential thing in the future um but as far as the general idea of understanding what's going on yes i completely agree some track charts of certain battles do look like somebody just threw spaghetti at a wall so unless and until I develop my own uh, animation skills, what I've been trying to do, and this is one of the things you saw maybe with the Jutland video, is I'm putting to work one of the skills I do have, which is model building and painting, to, instead of showing the track charts, to actually show the ships themselves in, in model form. Of course, that has its own delay because I've actually got to get the models, get the models painted, and then set them up and photograph them. But that's probably still faster at the moment than me trying to animate anything so where i can i'm doing that for the minute and at some point in the future if i manage to develop animation skills or i find someone who's willing to take on the unenviable task of large amounts of animation for various videos then maybe i can do that but that's that's basically why you don't see all that much animation on this channel billy anizari asks what made the Japanese Admiralty refrain from deploying their, all their battleships except the Congo class to the Guadalcanal campaign? Was it mainly because of their battleship speed and age factors? 
there are three primary factors involved, one of which is that the Japanese, for a considerable period of the Pacific War, were still obsessed with trying to get this decisive battle going, and the battleships were a core part of that, so they were retaining the battleships for the decisive battle rather than risking them in uh, sort of what they saw as critical but not decisive battle conflicts. So this is why you see Yamato, uh, Musashi, Nagato, etc. You see them sailing with the fleet when the Japanese think there might be a decisive battle, so Midway, for example, uh, and then later on, obviously, in the more desperate gambits like Leyte Gulf. But for something like Guadalcanal, they didn't think there was going to be a massive showdown with the core US fleet, so they weren't assigned to preserve them for when they theoretically would have a massive showdown with the US fleet. The second factor was they had some doubts as to whether large, deep draft, not particularly agile battleships could actually operate in some of the waters around Guadalcanal. Um, so that was one of the reasons they were relatively surprised when Washington and South Dakota showed up, amongst others. Although that was probably the, the lesser of the three factors. And then finally, probably the most critical factor for that particular campaign was speed. Because they knew that as long as Henderson Field remained operational, and also especially as long as US carriers were in the area, but Henderson Field as a, as a constant thing, which is why they kept trying to shoot it, any of their ships would be vulnerable to incoming American air attack. And they obviously didn't want to risk ships that could be caught out in the open. So they would do these high-speed runs in in the late afternoon, um, crossing the theoretical aircraft attack boundary around about evening, sail on through the night, conduct their operations, and then try to withdraw before dawn the following day, when obviously air attack would intensify again. The Congos could do this, because they were fast enough to keep up with the cruisers and destroyers and, and do that run, the battleships weren't, by and large. There's possibly some argument to say Yamato might have been able to, but see the previous concerns as to why they didn't deploy that. Um, but certainly Nagato, um, the Iseis, and the Fusos definitely weren't fast enough to do that, and they did not want to risk having potentially a, a battleship that might have been damaged somewhat overnight, being caught out in the open in the morning by air attacks, and the fate of some of the Congos actually you can see there there was a significant amount of reasonable logic behind that decision. Holy Crusader asks, why did the Germans not form multiple wolf packs as large as Wolf Pack West, considering how successful it was? Quite simply put, during the time period of Wolf Pack West, they couldn't. Um, if you look at a chart of number of U-boats on patrol, and that is number of U-boats on patrol total in all theatres during 1941. The number of U-boats the Germans actually have out there varies between around about 20 to a maximum of around about 60 towards the end of the year. So the 23 boats that made up Wolfpack West in uh, May, June 1941, that actually represents more than 50% of all U-boats out on patrol and therefore available for operations during those two months. So you physically couldn't form another Wolfpack as large as Wolfpack West because the Kriegsmarine simply didn't have the number of U-boats out there to do so. Um, maybe by the end of uh, 1941 you could have pulled off two such packs, but... Um, yeah, that would have been pretty much the limit. There were a lot more U-boats out on patrol in later subsequent years in the war, but that runs into another issue, which is Allied anti-submarine efforts, because the Wolf Packs were at their most successful in the earlier part of the war, um, but due in to a number of reasons on the German side, including a lack of actual coordinated attack tactics for the Wolf Packs, they were countered by people like the the Wrens at Western Approaches Command and the Wolf Pack tactics started to run into more and more losses 
Um, the, obviously, the, with the code breaking, the Allies also diverted the wolf packs away. Which, uh, sorry, diverted the convoys away from the wolf packs, which had a negative effect on their perception in in Germany. Because if you're concentrating so many submarines into a specific area and then they don't find anything, obviously they don't know the Allies are diverting the convoys specifically to avoid them. But they're going to think, well it's surely better to then have those couple of dozen submarines scattered out all across the Atlantic because then if one of them finds something, that's better than 20 finding nothing. Um, you've also got to look at the kill ratios. Um, a good U-boat on a patrol will come back with hopefully more than two or three kills, whereas if you look at the uh, Wolfpack West, although, yes, they were very successful, they sunk 33 um, ships and damaged another four in exchange for the loss of a single U-boat. It took 23 of them to do that, which is a kill ratio well below one and a half per uh, kills per boat. So whilst the concentrated destruction was quite significant, the actual kills per boat were quite a bit lower. And so in the overall analysis, um, it would look a lot more like sending a number of these boats out individually would probably return a greater number of kills because if let's say each u but if a u boat say kills five ships there on a on a lone patrol then you could conceivably deploy seven u boats instead of 23 for a better rate of return now obviously some u boats would never see anything other u boats would be driven off or sunk but others might come back with 10 kills so it all averages out the other thing to bear in mind is that whilst a large wolf pack attacking a convoy has a target rich environment it also means the escort groups have a target rich environment and that comes somewhat back to what we're talking about with the western approaches command training for those escort groups if a convoy is constantly under attack from a large wolf pack, then as long as the stamina and endurance of the escorts hold out, they're actually going to get into quite a rhythm and they're going to be probably starting to drive off and sink U-boats more and more rapidly. And remember, in, in this period, driving off a U-boat is, for the convoy at least, pretty much as good as sinking, at the, as sinking it because it's probably never going to catch up. That's not to say the Germans didn't try... Uh, in other periods in 1941, they did deploy a number of fairly large wolf packs. So in August, they deployed Wolf Pack Grönland, which deployed 21 submarines, um, but they only scored three kills, one damage. On the other hand, uh, Wolf Pack Markgraf was 15 boats with 17 kills and four damage in exchange for two U boats lost. Wolf Pack Brandenburg was 11 boats deployed for 11 kills. But Wolfpack Seewolf was 17 boats deployed for only five kills. Uh, later on in um, 41, you have Wolfpack Raubritter, 14 boats deployed, four kills. Wolfpack Storterbecker, 19 boats deployed, no kills at all. So and that's pretty much all the large wolf packs in the double digits for 1941. So just because Wolfpack West was relatively successful didn't mean that um, re just repeating the exercise of throwing large numbers of u-boats with all the logistics that that involved into one location at one time it didn't actually always work out particularly well even in 41 when the u-boats arguably had uh, the upper hand over a lot of allied escort groups for the Kriegsmen, it was probably relatively frustrating that the number of available u-boats they had to deploy reached its peak around late 1942 early 1943 that's the period when you have consistently well over 100 u-boats out on patrol um, albeit obviously some of them in the mediterranean but that's also the period when the allies pretty much hit back very hard with sort of frequency uh, radio frequency direction finding equipment long range aircraft better escorts new forms of anti-submarine uh, technology like hedgehog and that's when you see some fairly hefty wolf packs deployed towards um, the end of 42 and sort of high teens and uh, low uh, and, and in, in well into the double digits. I mean, wolf pack panther at the end of October 42 has 34 U-boats deployed. They only get three kills. Um, 
and then into 43 again you see teens and double digit u-boat wolf packs being deployed but they're mostly coming back with very very few kills for the number of boats deployed and as 43 progresses you start to see more and more u-boats being sunk in, in exchange for not a lot of rate of return so yeah wolf pack west to be perfectly honest is along with maybe two or three others something of an aberration in the level of success of wolf packs but also as i explained whilst the localized destruction is relatively intense it turns out it's probably actually more cost effective in the context of the Atlant battle of the atlantic to send out lone submarines and uh, and average out the overall kills that they score a lot of that is due to the allied signal interception granted if the allies weren't able to decipher all those signals they probably wouldn't have had anywhere near the level of success that they did in um, starving the wolf packs but those are the operational conditions that the case mariana had to deal with the devil in the circuit asks what was the reason for changing the shape of the primary weapon turret on u.s heavy cruisers from a rectangular box to the more common shape widely used later it goes back to some fundamental design choices that the U.S. Navy was making in the 1920s. For their cruisers, they and to a certain extent also their destroyers, they were looking into mainly firepower and speed at the expense of protection. Um, there's somewhat of a bias towards that. They were looking at even 12 8-inch gun designs that, with four triple turrets. But they were having to work within the constraints of the Washington Naval Treaty, which obviously put a cap of 10,000 tons displacement. And when they were building things like the Pensacolas and the Northamptons, etc., the Portlands, they discovered, according to their calculations, that it would be impossible to have a 8-inch gun cruiser that could move at a reasonable clip and had a reasonable armament and also protect said cruiser against 8-inch gunfire. And so instead they basically looked into, well, what will it take to protect us against 5.1-inch gunfire, i.e. what they thought of as destroyer-grade gunfire, um, instead. And as a result of that, they, those ships weren't especially well armoured, but when you don't have an awful lot of armour, you can afford to have a relatively large gun house, which is effectively what it was, um, for the turret. And that obviously has... Space, more space for operations within the turret but when they actually got to launching and commissioning a bunch of them they realized that with the various weight saving measures they'd put in these ships are actually coming in quite significantly under the 10,000 ton limit so when they were looking at well a, a batch run of heavy cruisers that they would then interrupt partially because some were in private yards they couldn't interrupt those but they could interrupt others change those designs those turned out to be the first of the Astoria later New Orleans class and they thought well hang on a minute if we've got this spare space um, or spare displacement we can provide at least some protection against eight inch gunfire not necessarily across the entire ship that's still out of the question but the vitals can be protected and so th they took got to work and going right okay well turrets fairly exposed fairly high value targets full of explosive probably a good idea to protect those and barbettes as well and so they needed a much more heavily protected turret for their new generation of heavy cruisers and obviously if you're going to put an eight inch slab of armor on a very large gun house that's going to cause an awful lot of weight issues and so they had to redesign it completely so for that new class of ship there was a much smaller but much more heavily protected turret shape and hopefully you can see that in the photo that accompanies this particular question on the right there you have the old school uh, triple or three gun turret and on the left hand side there you have the newer design on the new orleans class and you can see even though the newer ship is actually slightly closer to the camera and therefore perspective would tend to make the nearer turret look slightly larger it's still visibly smaller than the slightly further away older school gun house style but the difference is that that um the older gun house type 
is uh, has only got a sort of t just over two inches of armor protection. It's not going to resist anything more than destroyer grade gunfire at any significant range. Um, whereas the much more compact, uh, as, as you say, perhaps more classic looking uh, turret design on the New Orleans class, that is much, much more capable of standing up to uh, punishment, at least from directly ahead. But as a result, as you can see, it's gone significantly smaller and more traditional. And this is basically the thing that the traditional shape of turrets is largely down to trying to maximize armor protection and minimize size in order to maximize that protection without compromising too much on uh, the ability to actually operate the guns inside them. When you don't have those restrictions, you tend to see the gun houses go up significantly uh, in size, and that's where you get turrets like the one on the right. Turtle J one two three Smithy asks, "If you were Prime Minister of Australia, how would you change the Australian Navy's procurement production from nineteen eighteen to nineteen forty five, if you had full hindsight?" Austra the Royal Australian Navy. It's one of those ones that's relatively difficult to do because it, it's very easy to obviously say, well, they should have ordered more ships. Uh, and it's very easy to come up with a nice wish list of ships. But at the same time, you've got to recognise the operational reality that the Australian budget was limited. Australia's infrastructure ability to support ships was limited. So while it might be nice to say, yeah, well, sure, they should have a full battle fleet, they couldn't afford it and they wouldn't have the dockyard space for it anyway broadly speaking i think their decisions are relatively sound the only real differences that i would make and this is with full hindsight so this isn't necessarily faulting their decisions because the timing of of their orders are pretty largely actually relatively decent but with full hindsight going I would probably keep Australia and Canberra, maybe order a third, so that I can kind of guarantee to have at least one operational county-class heavy cruiser at any given time. I would change the Leander-class order to town-class, purely to give um, a lot more fighting power and also to have somewhat better protection. Now, whether or not... All that protection would protect the theoretical town class HMAS Sydney from its close range slugging match with Cormoran. Yeah. But it would certainly stand a much better chance than um, the Leander type Sydney. And, well, to be honest, if I'm already ordering an additional heavy cruiser and I'm updating from modified Leanders to towns, that's probably still keep at three because let's be we have to be somewhat realistic about the budget we're already increasing the budget somewhat but let's not go completely overboard um the order for tribal class destroyers although they weren't quite ready in 39 is probably a good one it's just unfortunate they got their order in kind of at the tail end of production so that the ships didn't really come into service until various stages during the war the problem is that in the interwar period, the Australian Navy is buying British, and whilst it might be tempting to try and buy elsewhere, that is going to cause all sorts of both political and operational complications in terms of interoperability of equipment. So I think it's probably safer to stay with ordering British, but I would probably at that point, again, using absolute full hindsight, maybe rather than go with the tribal's because I know they're going to be late, step back a little bit in time to sort of mid the mid-1930s when the Royal Navy is considering the Dido class. Now, I wouldn't order a Dido class because, again, the Dido class came in mid-war and they had all sorts of supply issues with their 5.25-inch, but I would probably take the predecessor design to the Dido, the one that actually led to both the Dido and the Tribal, the kind of large destroyer dash small cruiser type. And I'd intercept that at that stage and ask the Royal Navy to look at developing that into a small light cruiser. Now, I wouldn't use the 4.7 inch gun again using full hindsight because of the anti-aircraft issues, but I would maybe ask them to supply me with 
effectively a, a, a kind of Dido, but slightly smaller rather than using the 5.25s. I'd try and persuade them to build me something that maybe is a halfway house, either either a smaller Dido style design, i.e. ten guns using the five point uh, the four point five inch gun, which is already being installed on Arc Royal, so the production line should be in place. Or if I'm going to go for a ship about the same size as a Dido, I just over five thousand tons, maybe using the fact the four point five inch. Uh, gun and turret should be slightly smaller maybe go for a 12 gun layout so um three three stack twin mounts um i wouldn't quite go for the the k25 style <laughs> layout with all the guns but yeah something like that and i'd order a few of those instead of the tribals because i'm likely to actually get them in time for the water breakout and again, you exploiting hindsight, something with 10 or 12 4.5 inch dual purpose guns as a main armament, especially on a small sort of four and a half to five and a half thousand ton hull, is going to be an incredibly effective anti aircraft ship in an early part of the war where effective anti aircraft cover is fairly rare. And it's also going to be absolute murder on any Japanese destroyers or. To be honest, given their relatively light armor, a lot of their smaller cruisers that I might come across, and if I do have to face off against a big heavy cruiser or something, I'd well, that's what the counties are for. So yeah, that that would be my minor changes to the Australian Navy with it, which would still require a significant budget increase, but something that's within the realms of plausibility. Ian Croke asks, "What rules do you use when you wargame your alternate history engagements? Is it a published rule set or custom?" I've answered this a few times, but. So as there's uh, lots of new viewers, a couple of minutes won't hurt. Um, yeah, going back to a time when we could actually all meet up in large numbers and do uh, things like tabletop wargaming. Wasn't that a wonderful era way back when? Anyway, um, we use a the general quarters rules. There's general quarters, general quarters two, um, and various permutations thereof that cover World War One and World War Two as applicable. Those are the basic rules. There is a bunch of custom layering on top of that that we do, and but that is purely around kind of more accurately simulating the fog of war. Uh, so literal physical um, blinds so that the commanders can't actually see what's on the board. So only the umpire knows what's actually going on. The people who are actually making the decisions about where the ship should go, etc., are being informed by signals officers who can obviously only tell them certain things and then the people who are making the decisions have to kind of draw up what they think based on those reports is what's actually going on. Um, so they've got a relatively accurate picture of what their ship is doing and what the ship's immediately in visual range of them are doing but what they can see and what else they and therefore how they react to everything is dependent entirely on external reports which is much more realistic which can lead to some rather hilarious misinterpretations of what's going on because that's the one disadvantage of if you actually just take all your models out and have two people standing on either side of a board you have a completely unrealistic idea of what the enemy is actually doing because you can physically see them even if your models theoretically on paper can't. Matey83 asks would the Grand Fleet have benefited from transmitting data directly through the radio once the action had been joined by BT ships? Some information actually was, uh, for example, Second Light Cruiser Squadron reporting back the, when they spotted the German fleet, etc. So there, there was a certain amount of radio transmission going on, albeit not all of it. Obviously, BT was still communicating largely by signal. So, to be honest, once action was joined, BT signalling at all would have been useful. I think as far as radio communications go, the two most critical parts of the battle where, at least the early part of the battle, not going into the night action, where radio communication would have been very useful would have been BT when he made his turn and the and basically fifth battle squadron ended up not receiving those orders and going off on its own. So if he told everyone then by radio look we're all going south and therefore fifth battle squadron actually stays with the battle cruisers uh, 
that probably would have been very very useful um and as i say bt should have reported by radio to jellico what was going on so the protocol was already there the equipment was already there he just didn't <laughs> so yeah beyond beyond that initial change the the rest of it basically comes down to actually using the equipment he was supposed to rather than changing equipment because once once battle had been engaged if fifth battle squadron was in the line with the battle cruiser fleet most of the other tactical signal decisions that bt was making probably don't amount to all that much in terms of uh affecting the overall outcome of the battle the one caveat to all of that is obviously that the more and more the grand fleet transmits if they're trying to transmit to interrogate bt for information the more and more chance there is of the high seas fleet picking that up and realizing something big is in the offing somewhere nearby Boudakar Anis asks, why didn't Jellico relieve BT from command and why didn't BT get a board inquiry to kick him out from the Navy and instead ended up being promoted? It's a mixture of propaganda, politics and practicality, which shows up an awful lot when it comes to naval affairs, especially large battles. On the propaganda side, whilst obviously BT's forces had taken a, f a fair bit of a pounding, once the Admiralty had sorted out exactly what ships it had lost and collated various reports and tried to make estimates of how many ships the Germans had lost and then also, to a certain extent, amped them up a little bit, um, the propaganda that was going out was talking about a much more decisive victory. Basically, the narrative was, yes, we lost a number of ships and a lot of men, but the Germans lost even more. So from a propaganda side to then also turn around and say and by the way we're relieving bt of command would undermine that narrative because it would suggest that perhaps maybe that the, the if so if bt has led his battle cruisers by in the propaganda if he's led them in that yeah they've taken losses but they've also inflicted loads of losses on the enemy if then he's relieved of command it's kind of like well why what what's going on he won he, surely if if he's being relieved of command that suggests he lost but that goes against the propaganda narrative um so there's that aspect to it there's the politics side of things because as i've said before bt was very well connected politically much and um fairly good political operator so it would be very difficult to unseat him without significant repercussions both on the actual political field and also within the politics of the royal navy and then there's also the practicality side of things of relieving him of command immediately after the battle when the picture was still relatively unclear would have been unwise as the picture more clearly emerged it was that this time and distance had allowed obviously bt to start forming his uh, political group and his allies into shaping the narrative of the battle and also one but by the time a lot of the faults in signaling had come out uh then by this point bt had already ascended in power so he was able to kind of rewrite history a little bit in his favor and also to be fair also throw a seam, poor old seymour under the bus uh quite significantly so yeah it's kind of the the point at which bt could have potentially been relieved of command or at least prevented from further advancement is a very narrow window a few months after jutland when the extent of his failures was probably apparent to the upper echelons of the of the royal navy but he but bt himself hadn't had the chance to consolidate his own position where uh, but at that point to then take him aside and restrict him or even take him away from the battle cruiser fleet that would have undermined the narrative that was being promoted about jutland and by the time that and then that time passes by the time the narrative of jutland has settled out to 
somewhat more stable and well, again his faults are known by this point he's already in command of the Grand Fleet and he's very much retrenched himself in his own political uh, and al allied supporters side of this is how Jutland went and starting to cast aspersions on Admiral Jellicoe so yeah it, it's one of those things there, there was never an opportunity where all of the relevant stars aligned I think the only scenario in which BC probably could have been relieved of command after Jutland would have been possibly if one of the Queen Elizabeths had been extremely badly damaged and or sunk and Sheer hadn't been quite so good at turning away and therefore Jellicoe had inflicted a lot more damage and or losses on the high seas fleet potentially with uh, the night action going better in terms of Chalica actually being informed. So if if Beatty's forces had come away with slightly heavier losses and Jellico had come away with a much more decisive win, then the contrast between the two would have been much more significant and questions would have been asked a lot sooner and a lot more pointedly as to basically why, if Beatty has a... At almost the same kind of numerical advantage by ratio as Jellicoe had. Why has Beatty come away with a third of his fleet at the bottom of the ocean and Jellicoe has come away with no losses and having sent maybe a third of the German fleet to the bottom of the ocean? Those kind of questions in the light of the overall, an overall much more significant British victory might have then brought Beatty down because everyone would have been able to quite safely sit and say, yes, the narrative of British victory is still there and a very strong victory, but this one element of it kind of slightly ruined it. It could have been a lot, an even better victory. Um, and that, that might have seen BT, BT's career either halted in its tracks or, or stopped completely, but obviously it didn't happen, so he wasn't relieved. The Brain Specialist asks, a uh, question... Why was the man second in line to the throne allowed to sail into combat? I know he wasn't the Prince of Wales, but it does seem a short-sighted political move. The royals are usually reservists, aren't they? You'd be surprised, actually, that the British royal family has a fairly long tradition of various members of it serving actively in the military, as long as they aren't the reigning monarch. And, well, to be fair, right up until one of the Georges, the reigning monarch was kind of expected to lead troops on the battlefield. Um, but after that, yeah, they, they a lot of um, royal... a uh, lot of royal family members, including the Prince of Wales at various points, would have military careers. A lot of it was in the Royal Navy, um, more recently, uh, some have served in the Army and the Air Force. A lot have actually served in more than one service, usually a mixture of Air Force and Naval service. When it comes to their position, no, they're not usually reservists. They're usually just part of a unit. And if that unit gets deployed or called into action, they go with it. Um, obviously, in this case, the future King George VI was at Jutland on Collingwood. Um but also, uh, more recently, various uh, members have been in the armed forces and at times been called to serve. So the Prince of Wales, Prince Charles, whilst he was Prince of Wales, had a Air Force and Navy career. And he served on a number of Royal Navy ships. And if there had been some kind of war in the early to 1970s, he would have been called into action along with everyone else on his ship um in the 1980s when the falklands war broke out uh prince andrew was part of the royal navy and he went out to the falklands just like everyone else and well he took the role of flying exocet missile decoy which isn't exactly a reservist position so yeah and of course uh, more recently um during his army career prince harry was deployed to afghanistan so yeah um Deploying ro royal family members into open combat is not exactly an unusual um, precedent for the royal family, albeit I must admit that um, in all cases where that has happened, there has been at least one other uh, 
um, heir to the throne available, whether they be further up or down the line of succession. So um, it, it's basically generally seen that it's much better for members of the royal family to do their, their duty alongside everybody else in the military rather than claim any kind of special exemption because at the end of the day they are another person and as long as there's at least one other uh, person in the royal family to carry on the line of succession well uh, to be perfectly blunt if they do get killed in action they've died doing their duty it doesn't actually affect the future of the royal family all that much Vinve asks how long was the maximum period a uh, coal burning warship could sustain its maximum speed taking into consideration the amount of extra work this required from the stokers uh, were there any examples of ships reaching their cruise limits before or during World War I that changed the outcome of actions? And was this a more common problem on smaller ships rather than on capital ships with larger engine room crews? Accounts from naval officers of the time seem to generally agree on a period of about 8 to 12 hours as the maximum sustainable uh, time period for full speed on a coal-burning ship, and that's assuming that you're going for kind of top rated speed rather than literally shovel every bit of coal that you can in without killing the fires to go into complete overload um, that would be considerably shorter but that would depend on the conditions in the ship if especially with things like forced draft now within that to be honest that's largely more a limit of the engines than anything else um, and in some cases also a limit from the coal now, we know, for example, at Jutland, that German ships that had the um, somewhat less than ideal coal loads were effectively crippled in terms of top speed by the conclusion of the day, so significantly less than 8 to 12 hours steaming at full speed, simply because the boilers had gotten clogged with ash and clinker. Then you've got... The, I say the limitations of the engines themselves, a vertical triple expansion engine run at full whack for that time period after about the sort of 8, 10, 12 hour mark is going to start suffering some fairly serious issues. So you wouldn't want to run it much past that anyway, unless you were very lucky and it was a very well maintained engine. And it also pretty much reflects the probably upper level of human endurance once you take into account, obviously, that they're rotating through the various crew. Um, so you wouldn't have the same set of stokers going at it for 8 to 12 hours. You'd have a set of stokers, they'd be shoveling coal, and once they start to hit the limit of their endurance, you'd put in a fresh crew of stokers, and the first lot would rest. But given the amount of physical exertion they'd gone through, that first lot would be back into action at some point later on. They'd still they'd be much fresher, but they would have a, a shorter endurance because they wouldn't be fully recovered, and so you'd kind of wind out of crew endurance levels at about the same kind of time. On much smaller ships like destroyers, you're probably actually more at risk of running out of fuel than anything else if you tried to run for more than eight to twelve hours, plus the machinery issues. Um, but also, if you're talking about much much smaller ships, because remember cruisers, mo a lot of them were almost the same size or or in some cases even larger than battleships um, especially in the pre-world war one era but with much smaller ships the obviously the stokers would be a much smaller team at which point adding in one or two men from elsewhere in the ship might actually make a significant difference whereas one or two men it's not going to make too much of a difference to a battleship stoking crew as for actions that were changed I can't think of any that were changed by the crews reaching their limit, because to be perfectly honest, if, if an engagement's gone on for 8 to 12 or more hours, you are in a lot of trouble. Anyway, there's going to be a lot more issues than just the fact your stokers have reached the physical limit of their capabilities. Um, you may have seen some of those issues perhaps reached in the night action at Jutland if it hadn't been for the fact, as I said, that a lot of the ships that might otherwise have been affected, like some German destroyers, had been crippled by other issues like, you know, the, their um, their dodgy coal. Classe Cornate asks, Did the Russian 3rd Pacific Squadron include things from the central battery ironclad era? And Wikipedia seems to think so. It depends how you define the central battery ironclad era. Um, the Royal Navy, for example, was still building central battery ironclads up to the mid-1870s, and 
for or in other navies. There were sh central battery ironclads being built a little bit later than that, but generally speaking, most people accept kind of the 1880 as a rough cutoff point for central battery ironclads. So in terms of that, well, then no, there were no central battery ironclad warships present on the Russian side. Well, they, they flat out weren't central battery ironclad warships present on the Russian side, but there weren't also warships from the central battery ironclad era on the Russian side. Uh, as far as some of the supply ships or whatever, maybe one or two might have been that old, but the closest I think you're going to come is the old uh, cruiser Dmitry Donskoy, as uh, seen here, which was laid down in 1881, so just missed the central battery ironclad era, and also, as you can see, is not a central battery ironclad. Loch Ness Hamster asks, Before the development of guided missiles, were there any attempts to use rockets against ships, either launched from aircraft or other ship? The answer is yes, you can go back quite a fair way. All the way back to the early gunpowder rockets and things like the Congreve rockets, but um, in terms of uh, anti-ship use, which was perhaps, should we say, more consistent and effective, you're probably looking at a World War II, where a whole variety of rocket systems were developed and used against uh, shipping, mostly from aircraft, to be perfectly fair. So one example, uh, quite commonly used the RP-3 rocket shown here, used by various Royal Navy and Royal Air Force aircraft against shipping. It was relatively popular because it was fairly high speed. It had a certain degree of armor penetration capability, and the explosive payload was the equivalent of roughly uh, an 8-inch high explosive shell. Um, it was actually slightly more. It was about 12.5 kilo bursting charge as opposed to a 10 kilo bursting charge on the shell. Um, so combined with their arm somewhat uh, degree of armor piercing capability, effectively, if you were talking about something like a bow fighter or a mosquito, it gave you a, a kind of a one-off heavy cruiser salvo, a one-shot heavy cruiser salvo, and obviously every aircraft that you had theoretically had that salvo. So you they they were quite effective once they got those those running and being hit by a bunch of them was no joke um towards the end of the war there were some even bigger rockets being produced um famously perhaps the u.s tiny tim rocket right towards the end of the war with an even bigger um weapon with even greater explosive payload but yes uh mostly from aircraft there were rock unguided rockets being used against shipping in quite extensive amounts, actually, on, on most sides of World War II. Econoclast asks, You've explained in your video about range finding that the ideal number of guns for a range finding fire is four, since you need three and four to allow for e easily eliminating rogue values, and you've also explained in a dry dock that a ship would ideally proceed with half salvos to find the range, which could be a bit more complicated on nine-gun ships versus eight-gun ships. So would you say that Renown or a refitted 15-inch Scharnhorst with only six guns had a major handicap there? And uh, why decide for such a usually unusually low number of guns anyway? As for why a low number of guns, with Renown's case, pretty much the same as all pre-World War I and World War I battle cruisers, they tended to follow this general rule of thumb of their armament being the same caliber as the battleships that were under construction at the time minus a turret uh, and in exchange and obviously minus some armor in exchange for the speed so if you look at so the invincibles they have eight guns whereas dreadnought has 10 the lion uh, princess royal queen mary and tiger they all correspond to the um orion king george v iron duke etc and all of those battleships have 10 13.5 inch guns. All the battle cruisers have 8 13.5 inch guns. And you see the same with the German ships, where, for example, Deflinger, the Deflinger class have 8 12 inch guns versus the 10 12 inch guns on uh, the Kaisers and Koenigs, and likewise with the 11 inch battle cruisers. And so with Renown, well, the battleships in production at the time were the R-Class, which they're obviously derived, not well, they're not derived from, they use the materials set aside for, and those have eight 15-inch guns, so they have six 15-inch guns. 
when it comes to the Scharnhorsts, that's more a product of just the refit. They were designed with three triple turret, 11 inch turrets. And so while well, they've only then got three barbettes, so if they're going to upgrade, you can't fit a triple 15 inch turret on the same barbette ring as a triple 11 inch, not unless you want to have the world's least accurate and most cramped 15 inch turret in recorded history. So that means you've got a twin, and if you've only got three barbettes, that means you have six guns. That's just the way of things. As far as having a major handicap in that respect, yeah, in theory, you, that they do have a bit of a problem, because unlike ships with a minimum of eight guns, they can't really do half salvos. I mean, you, you could, in theory, do half salvos of three, I guess, but the accuracy, the confidence of those salvos is going to be significantly less. In a lot of ways, both Renown and... Um, well, not Sharnhorst, because Sharnhorst wasn't refitted, but in a lot of ways, Renown and Repulse got away with it because they were only really involved in one major action where, to be fair, their shooting wasn't brilliant um, in World War One. And of, I mean, obviously, Repulse got sunk relatively early into World War Two, but Renown certainly, in all of its various actions, it kind of had lucked out in as much as because it had been modernised, it had radar, it had um, up-to-date fire control equipment, it had up-to-date rangefinders, and so it was much more able to place accurate gunfire early on. And then obviously once it's got accurate gunfire going, um, it could keep that accurate gunfire up. In fact, Renown also benefited from having a gunnery crew who were very, very good at their jobs. So yeah, in the era of optical rangefinding only, it is something of a handicap. In fact, it's quite a significant handicap. It just so happens that for the ships that would have been most affected by it, they, they lucked out by mostly seeing action in an era of where radar and more advanced fire control systems could, to a certain degree, mitigate against that. Dave Collier asks, Could you tell us the story or history of the Resolute Desk? So the Resolute Desk actually connects two disparate incidents in the 19th century. Well, one, the rather disastrous Franklin expedition, the other, ironically enough, um, serving to prevent what could have been the third Anglo-US uh, Anglo war. No, Anglo-American War. So, originally, it all starts out with the Franklin Expedition, which, as many probably know, um, Sir John Franklin goes out with HMS Erebus and Terror, trying to get through the Northwest Passage, and then vanishes for a considerable portion of time with no survivors. The Royal Navy then eventually sends out an expedition to search for him, which includes uh, five ships, one of which is HMS Resolute, specially modified as an icebreaker. And in something of a hilarious farce, um, four of the five ships and the four that actually head off into the passage as opposed to one which acts as a base ship, they also all get stuck in the ice um, and are abandoned albeit that this time the abandonment is much more successful. All the crews manage to reach back to the base ship and head on home. Three of them, uh, an intrepid pioneer and assistants, really much not seen again. Resolute, however, after quite some time, um, pops out of the ice and is discovered drifting, um, unmanned and damaged in the ocean and eventually is brought back in by an American whaling ship that's found it in 1855, three years after it set out from the UK. Now, in the intervening time, as I said, there was a bit of a tension going on between uh, the British Empire and the United States of America. There were all sorts of clashes over territory rights, both oceanic and land-based in either on the Canadian border and also down in the uh, in South America. And there was a perhaps misguided notion in the US that they could, in the mid-1850s, could go to war with Britain and win a naval conflict. There are legitimate documents arguing this, and I have no idea who wrote them and what they were on. Um, but never mind. 
in any case, the Resolute just kind of pops up and someone comes up with a good idea of, well, this this is a British ship that was sent to look for a lost British expedition, which, nope, still hasn't been found. If we, say, refit it and send it back to Britain in tip-top condition, maybe this kind of gift will be a good way of smoothing over tensions. And it actually worked. It worked fairly well. Um, Resolute then stayed in Royal Navy service for another couple of decades. And then when it was being broken up, Queen Victoria, who obviously had been reigning at the time and was still reigning, um, sort of went, oh, well, it'd be a nice thing to uh, make a, a, a gift to further improve Anglo-American relations from the timbers of the Resolute. And so she commissioned, well, a number of things, but as it turned out, the Resolute desk was actually what ended up being made. And that got sent back over to the US president of the time as, again, a gesture of friendship using obviously the symbolism of the fact it was made from the timbers of the Resolute, which the Americans had used as a gesture of friendship before. And it's pretty much stayed in the White House in some way, shape or form most of the time since then. Um, Robert Hedges asks, Obviously in World War One and World War Two, personal safety was not taken quite as seriously as it is today in many ways. I've been wondering what kinds of personal protective equipment were issued to sailors on ships of the era. So what kind of hearing protection do they get? Um was breathing apparatus for damage control teams or firefighters issued to individuals or were they community property stowed in specific places to whomever was assigned that duty at the time well while we're answering that question you can put up with uh, these austro-hungarian anti-flash gear sa equipped sailors because if i have to put up with a bunch of poor old people who look like cheap doctor who villains so do you um anyway uh, ppe for sailors on ships it varied considerably over the, that period, World War One, World War Two, largely in respect of advances in technology and partly also in respect of identified new threats. So after Jutland, for example, the Royal Navy introduced anti-flash gear. Um, other navies introduced anti-flash gear around the same kind of World War One period because that was a new recognised threat. Previous to that, they didn't. Um, but that was obviously issued to pretty much anyone who might be subjected to it. Personal respiratory and breathing equipment, again, was something of a technology that was evolving during the early 20th century. So early on, damage control parties, etc., you really aren't going to have much if, if in the way of um, respirators, etc., because, well, they personal portable respirators pro simply don't exist. Well, um, apart from in things like diving suits, which are far too large and cumbersome for work inside a ship that's potentially on fire. But as time goes on and you start to get portable air flasks and portable respirators, that kind of stuff, um, a lot of personal protective gear is obviously sort of dealing with heat uh, because of the risk of fire. So a lot of that actually contains asbestos, um, which is not necessarily the best thing for your long-term health, but probably better than nothing for your short-term health um, and so on and so forth all of this stuff is gradually being introduced during the early 20th century sometimes in reaction to new dangers that popped up sometimes just because well the technology has now been developed generally unless it's something that's issued to all or large parts of the crew it wouldn't be um, individual kit and uh, so unless it has to be specifically fitted or everyone's got one it's not going to be um, something that, ev like, uh, here is a named respirator for this particular person. Because, well, for one thing, um, there aren't going to be enough to go around. And for two, if the ship is damaged um, and on fire or something like that, it's a very, very possible that the person to whom, if you assigned a respirator on a per-person basis, it's very possible that person may be dead or injured. So then it would be a pointless piece of equipment because if it's sitting in their personal locker or something, um, then it's not being used to save the ship. And there certainly aren't enough of them for everyone. So it would be a case of, right, here's the damage control station or stations, depending on the size of the ship. Here's the equipment. We have people who are trained to use it primarily, uh, but everyone kind of has a vague understanding of how to use it. So it's kind of whoever is nearby and has an idea of how to fight the problem that they're fighting, you grab that equipment and you use it. And similarly with ear protection, the firepower of guns and the net noise, etc. was a known factor. 
but again ear defenders and such not really a thing generally at the time so say for example at Jutland people just carry big wads of uh, raw cotton wool and they'd stuff those in their ears and that would be your your ear defense um again once more formal ear defenders were um invented and distributed they started to show up but yeah the it's not even the that people didn't care so much but in 1900 1910 a lot of the personal protective equipment that we take for granted or even sailors at the end of world war ii take took for granted simply hadn't been invented and a couple of missed questions um hagakaze asks um 18 the total plan number of sentoku class submarines are mysteriously delivered in 1940 to the Kriegsmarine. How does it affect the Battle of the Atlantic? Now, for those of you who are unaware, the Sentoku is the I-400 class. Now, we're assuming we're going to hand wave aside all the you know, operational issues of a Japanese set of submarines operating from Kriegsmarine infrastructure and so forth, and just looking purely at their um, operational and combat capabilities. In early 1940, I think, they could have had quite a significant impact, apart from anything else, as we mentioned um, earlier in another question, the number of submarines the Germans had operational in 1940 at any given time on patrol was not particularly high, so 18 large new submarines does actually make a substantial difference to the numbers they can deploy. They're also obviously very long range, which allows them to get out into the mid-Atlantic um, quite uh quite easily so they've got a much much more wide field of operation or if they're operating at roughly the same areas as the rest of the kriegsmarine u-boats they can operate for longer now they are obviously quite large which they're not the world's most agile or handy vessels so although they do carry a significant torpedo armament and also actually a fairly reasonable gun armament especially in terms of anti-aircraft guns assuming i think that they probably replace the 25 mils with the flak veerlings that actually stands them in relatively good stead against the relatively few aircraft they might encounter in 1940 um but i, I wouldn't necessarily want to take such a large vessel into sort of convoy attack although they are fairly quick surfaced and actually relatively quick submerged compared to german u-boats still not saying all that much six and a half knots their sheer size and lack of agility and obviously it's going to affect their diving time as well they would be a little bit more vulnerable to escorts attacking them um they'd be very good at picking off lone merchantmen such as there were where i could probably most see them being useful however would be in helping to coordinate the wolf packs because one of the big issues with the wolf packs was they had to be all strung out to see an incoming uh convoy and obviously as a as a uh, submarine you don't have the world's greatest line of sight <laughs> considering the uh, conning towers not exactly massively high above the water so where i could see them being quite useful would be maybe assigning a couple of them to a, a large wolf pack and then instead of having to string all your subs out what you could do instead is use the fact that these these um submarines can use seaplanes um obviously they are the, the submarine aircraft carriers and you can use those as a way of scouting a much wider area. obviously you've got things like the the condors etc that could do scout missions but um one they're luftwaffe and two they have a fairly long cycle time these could be used much more point and also much further out into the atlantic because obviously they're launching from the subs and so you can use those as a way of finding a convoy and then once you found a convoy your i guess at this point new command sub can relay that information to the rest of the wolf pack which would then be able to concentrate and congregate along the likely path of the convoy m with uh, more notice and therefore get a better concentration of force than they would be with just a submarine spotting them effectively when they're almost running over the sub 
And if you're really ambitious and you kind of use them as a backstop, you could, uh, behind the, the line of U-boats, you could even shadow, to a certain extent, the convoy and kind of provide almost a blow-by-blow. Now, obviously, that's not going to help the U-boat, most of the U-boats, because if a U-boat is submerged and under attack by an escort, that's not really helping that much. But you could have, again, in 1940, when the anti-aircraft defences of the convoys aren't particularly fantastic, you could have uh, one or more aircraft circling above the convoy, and as the various subs are coming in, it can kind of say, okay, well, I can see that this convoy has six escorts, but four of them are on the north side of the convoy because they've just gone after somebody don't know who but good luck to whoever you are and there's one in the lead and there's maybe one one astern but there doesn't seem to be anyone covering say the southern edge of the convoy so incoming u-boats that are still either periscope depth or on the surface that are further out might hear that and then they would be able to read to a certain extent um, adjust their approach vectors so that they maybe can attack from the less protected side of the convoys. So acting in that role, they might very well be useful, um, but that utility will decrease quite rapidly. Obviously, as things like catapult armed merchantmen, escort carriers, etc., come up, and the anti-aircraft guns uh, all on convoys also improve. So that seaplane utility will probably decrease quite dramatically, quite quickly. With that, what you then might see them used for is kind of like some other German submarines we used is kind of supply, resupply subs for other smaller U-boats in the mid-Atlantic to sustain the operations of those U-boats. So you might then take out the aircraft and convert the hangar into a store supply area. And also you might deploy once the Battle of the Atlantic really starts hotting up, you might start deploying these um, larger subs, you exploiting their range to go into areas which are much less heavily defended, and thus might you might be able to um, enact considerably more destruction despite their relative lack of agility. So places like the South Atlantic, maybe even the Indian Ocean. And finally, Dan asks a fairly extensive question which involves an alternate timeline where Britain and Germany are allied in 1940 and decide to go with a joint battle cruiser design um, and are apparently at war with the US and Japan who are allies, so yeah, very different world. And these are very much um, in the sort of in the spirit of the super cruiser, cruiser killer type thing, so no main armament. Uh, 12 guns in four triple mounts, standard super firing pairs using either 9.2 or 9.4 inch guns, uh, secondary battery, 10 128mm dual purpose, um, twin mounts, a mixture of 40mm bofors, 20mm, yeah, 20mm flak veerlings, and a couple of quad torpedo launchers propelled by uh, whatever the best marine diesels anyone can come up with. The idea of them apparently is to operate in pairs, going after merchant shipping, uh, obviously having the firepower and protection to fight off cruisers, with the secondary rollers, heavy carrier and escorts and battle screens. And it says, assuming they're commissioned, what do you feel their impact would have been in their designated roles, assuming they're captained relatively intelligently? So, uh, as you said, there will be a number of weaknesses in the design, so I'll go over those first. Um... Using marine diesels, I think, is probably a mistake. Marine diesels were not at the point where they could provide the necessary speed. You're effectively ter generating something along the lines of a, a possibly slightly larger but differently armed panzer ship, and that is going to run into effectively the problem, especially fighting a American Japanese alliance, that all the, the heavy cruisers you're likely to face can outrun you which means you can be mobbed, even if you've got two. Okay, fair enough. You might need six or so or more heavy cruisers to counter you, but um, an American-Japanese alliance definitely can field those kinds of squadrons in order to counter you. So I think there you definitely would want... Um, you definitely want a faster vessel, so you probably want to go for steam turbines. Um the 128mm dual purpose in 1940 is not really going to happen. It's a, it's a somewhat later development. 
Um, so unless you're delaying these ships quite considerably, you probably want something more like, me well, ideally, given the weapons available to the British and the Germans in 1940, we probably want the 4.5 um, for defense, um, maybe arranged in a probably what, I mean, we're talking about something probably approaching the size of an Alaska or similar. So you probably want maybe three, three, tu three twin turrets either side and then one super firing for one super firing aft as well. Maybe, maybe squeeze an extra one in per side, depending on the overall displacement. Um, outside of that, it's a relatively solid super cruiser design. Um, the main, I mean, the main problem you're going to have is one, you're fighting a combined American Japanese fleet, which means they dominate the Pacific quite easily, and they have the industrial capacity of the states. Admittedly, British industrial capacity is going to show slightly better because they're not being bombed all the time by the Germans, and likewise for the Germans, but um, still the overall shipbuilding capacity is going to be at something of a, a downside, especially, especially if the Americans kind of share things like the 40mm to replace the 25mm on Japanese ships. As far as the primary goals that you're talking about, hunting merchant ships, fighting cruisers, they do that fairly well, assuming that they have turbines so that they can run away you you would need they'd probably be looking at sort of 20,000 tons ish and needing to get up to speed of course once they if Americans finish the Alaskas maybe the Japanese finish the B-64 B-65 then they're going to have some issues um you you need to at least probably 33 34 knots ideally more because apart from anything you want to outrun things like the Congos I'm using the picture of Goliath because obviously there there isn't a, a sketch for this so it's roughly the closest you're going to get um so yeah as, as the impact the impact will probably be much more pronounced in the indian and western pacific operating against the japanese the americans will probably have the numbers and doctrine um in terms of their ships to protect their merchant ship you might get some early success but american cruiser squadrons would fairly quickly form up and make your job a lot more difficult um Whereas the Japanese are probably going to be slightly slower to react to that um, and a little bit more careful with their forces. Um, also, Japanese cruisers as a rule generally probably slightly more vulnerable to your fire than some of the most of the American ones. So, yeah, they'd have a certain amount of impact merchant raiding in the Western Pacific Indian Ocean areas. And, well, with, with that kind of heavy anti-aircraft armament, they'd make decent fleet escorts. But, as I say, the, the big but that's hanging over all of that is um, uninterrupted American industry plus the Japanese fleet. It, it, the industrial advantage means that it, it is kind of in the same boat as, well, what if Japan had done this, that, or the other in the historic Pacific War? Yes, they could have improved their outcomes, no, they're not likely to overall affect the outcome of the war just because they happen to be a couple of particularly good ships. Um, yeah, it, especially if we're talking about... Uh, I mean, it, 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 there's a lot of unanswered questions in that kind of alternate timeline scenario, like why are Britain and Germany allied? What's happened to the rest of Europe, etc., etc.? Um, and that's the subject of a far, far greater consideration. And that brings us to channel admin for this particular episode of the Dry Dock. There's not an awful lot to say, um, to be perfectly honest at this point, other than, of course, the UK has gone into uh, national lockdown to Electric Boogaloo um, now with snow. So, uh, and oh, and uh, one of the mass vaccination centres in the UK is being set up literally five minutes down the road from me. Um, so that's going to be fun. Um, but yeah, that's kind of obviously, that's pushed back some tentative plans I had for the early part of this year, possibly being able to go and see some uh, more museums, filming, etc. Um, but, oh well, such is life. We shall, we shall persevere. And yeah, theoretically, I'd like to be able to maybe consider the uh, trip, much delayed trip to America around about August, late August-ish, early September. But at the moment, with the way things are going, I'm not necessarily going to hold my breath on that, to be perfectly honest. 
Um, it'll be really irritating if everything gets kicked over into 2022. Um, so hopefully at some point later this year I will be able to make the America trip. But if that doesn't happen, um, then depending on, again, depending on what the situation is and where is, is and isn't safe, um, and indeed has their borders open, um, I might try and uh, see some more European museum ships which i obviously can do in sort of day trips and stuff like that so yeah other than that um thank you very much for listening thank you very much for watching and hope to see you again in another video